EA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 963 FM, The Source. Twenty-five minutes before ten o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Don't go anywhere. You are going to be spellbound in the next twenty-five minutes by Rachel Slade. Rachel's on the phone. Oh my gosh, her book is doing well. What do, you, an do, honor. You, do you remember about two and a half years ago that we had a storm out in the Caribbean? I guess I'm trying to remember where it was exactly. I can't remember which storm it was, but there was a ship that sunk. Remember, um, uh, it was called the Altharo. El Faro, yes. um, and there was so many stories about well, what happened. And the the captain of the ship, Michael, oh my gosh, I can't remember his last name, Davidson, I think, Michael Davidson. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he was kind of painted in a bad way, and I don't know that that's fair or not because I remember hearing uh, an interview with his wife, like uh, sometime after the the fact, where she was kind of defending him and saying, "No, he knew what he was doing. He had so, well, of course, that's what you would say. Of course, you're someone you love." Um, anyway, uh, Rachel Slade took this story. She's a journalist, and my gosh, her book, Into the Raging Sea, 33 Mariners, One Megastorm, and the Sinking of El Faro. Let me just brag about the book itself and her accomplishment in such a short time. The book itself only came out, I think, May 1st, according to Amazon. Um, it is currently, are you ready for this? Number one in transportation category, number one in natural disaster category, number one in the maritime history and piracy category. It is a number one book uh, across the board in so many different categories. Uh, Rachel Slade, good morning. How are you? Hi, Larry and Robin. Thank you for having me. What What an amazing accomplishment and amazing work you've done. So many people that have read your book are saying this finally clears up. You have done something that the media wasn't able to do. You you helped us understand what really happened that day. Wow. Well, you know, it's great to have the room to be able to talk about it. And 400 pages is just about enough uh, paper that you need to be able to do this. I mean, it's a very, very complicated story. Is that why we didn't get it? Because newspapers and, and radio shows, everything that is associated with the media is so limited in space and time? Well, you know, I think one of the things that I really tried to do besides just tell the story and get you on that ship and quote from this 26 hours of audio that we captured, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I mean, this comes out of the longest uh, black box recording ever captured. This is a historic black box recording. It's 26 hours tape on the bridge. And so I use that to basically humanize the people who were working on the ship and found themselves in this awful position. Including Captain Michael's, uh, Michael Davison, right? Correct, yes. I mean, that's what's so great about these transcripts is now we really understand the decision-making and the discussion and then the growing fear among the officers that they were heading in the wrong direction, but they couldn't challenge their captain. So was he, was there something going on with him? Because his wife was very defensive of him. Was there something going on? You know, again, it's a complicated story and I'd love for folks to read my book so that they can really understand it. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot going on with him. And just like all of us, you know, he was concerned about job security and for very good reasons. He'd been passed over for a few promotions. He didn't know why. And he had two girls in college. He had high expenses. These are great paying jobs if you can get them. Captain jobs in the U.S. Merchant Marine. Yeah. But there aren't a lot of them. Wow. How did, how did this story attract you? I'm just curious how you uh, took this one and ran with it. So I've always been fascinated by the sea, the ocean. And you know, shipping is the backbone of the global economy. It's the only way that um, that this whole system runs. And so I really wanted to understand or find a way in to this industry. And this was a way for me to finally, finally, like meet the people who are doing the work that drive America's economy. And the cargo that he was carrying was uh, cost a lot of money. 
Yes, I mean, it was about $25 million worth of cargo. It included new cars. It included all types of food and products that would fill Puerto Rico's, sh- Puerto Rico's shelves. I mean, this ship was the lifeline for Puerto Rico. It delivered goods twice a week to Puerto Rico. It was it, it, Without that ship landing in Puerto Rico, the shelves would be bare in, in just a day in Puerto Rico. Wow. So were you able to, uh, besides the 26 hours of audio, were you able to interview anybody that would have information? Did it, uh, forgive, forgive me for not knowing this. Did everybody die on the ship? Oh, yes. Okay. So it was 33 mariners all unfortunately went down 15,000 feet down, which wow. is three miles. It's um, deeper than the Titanic. Yes, they all perished with the ship very uh, Because it made so many trips, the, the ship itself back and forth, was there neglect on the part of the uh, quality control guys that would uh, survey the ship to see if anything needed repair? Yeah, so that's a tricky question, Robin, and I I try to navigate that one very carefully. But, you know, we have a whole system for regulating and inspecting ships. And in my book, I argue that there were some shortcomings. But let's just keep in mind, why did we have a 40-year-old ship doing this regular run? Do you know that America's fleet, the U.S. Merchant Marine, is one of the oldest fleets in the world? I mean, even Liberia would not have allowed this this to oh be my flagged gosh. under it. Yeah, yeah, and, and, we, we really have a problem. And see, I, I heard that it was 40 years old, but I didn't know if that was, now that you say it that way, it's almost dumb that I didn't realize it was old. But, you know, you hear about this a lot with, like, with airplanes. You hear about these planes, and then somebody will, will defend that and say, well, wait a minute, but they are kept up. But so that wasn't the case with this. It was 40 years old and it was not kept up. Would that have helped at all if it was a younger boat? I, I thought the, the storm was the big issue. Well, I mean, the storm, certainly, but the the boat was extremely vulnerable because of its age, and not necessarily because it wasn't kept up, although it did have problems, but really the issue is that we have learned so much in 40 years about ship vulnerabilities and ship design, and so the way the ship was designed, you know, satisfied regulations in the 60s, 1960s, <laughs> before I was born, <laughs> but um, but nowadays you wouldn't be able to build it as it was designed. Because we've changed regulations because we've learned. We've right, learned from right. accidents. Right, right. You know. how, how did you gain the trust of the people that you interviewed? Because in today's world, it seems like everybody's quickly running for attorneys. And they won't say anything without their attorney. Mm. Wow, Robin, that is such a great question. You know, it's a very difficult thing to do to people, especially family members, and say, hey, can you tell me your story? Can you tell me about your loved one? Can you tell me about your loss? I mean, that is obviously the hardest part of any journalist's job. And I, I think that, you know, the family members understood that, well, the family members who did, because some chose not to, understood that there was, that I was sincerely interested. I did not have an agenda. And I really wanted to, like I said before, humanize this tragedy. I didn't want it to be, oh, that ship and those people and shipping and people. You know, I really wanted it to be about Danielle, Danielle Randolph. She was the second mate. I wanted it to be about Jeremy Ream, the third mm-hmm. mate. You know, I really wanted to understand these folks so I could portray them fairly, accurately, and, and compassionately. Yes, yes, because it's not just a news story with a number. These are individual human beings with real lives. I, I love that approach, by the way. I don't know if, as a journalist in today's world, you have the freedom to do that, even in a newspaper type of article. But I can remember, as, as a younger man, I can remember when when it would say the story continued on page six E or something, and then and then you would go there, and it's almost like a whole book. But the newspapers don't do that anymore. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's hard, you know, we don't buy papers anymore. We do so much online and we're not paying for it. So, you know, the ad revenue isn't there. I mean, that's a whole other story. I'm a magazine writer, so I'm used to having longer, you know, it's a longer form. Um, But so I saw each of these chapters as as a a magazine article. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, You... um you also had hands-on experience piloting some of the boats, and you mentioned that it was a very scary time for you. 
<laughs> well, fortunately, I was not actually doing the piloting, but I did travel with Captain Eric Bryson of the St. John's Pilot Association. St. John's uh, River, of course, is in Jacksonville. And Eric was the actual pilot who took El Faro out for her final run. So he had a deep connection to the story, and he was kind enough to let me travel with him. And I'll just tell you, to board a ship from sea requires you to take your little pilot boat up to the side of an enormous ship and then somebody on the ship throws down a rope ladder and so you're looking up at this rope ladder and you're looking down at the ocean that's just rushing below you between your little boat and the ship and you're like this could be the end Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're you're actually you know you're like you're writing your own obit you know like Noted journalist Rachel Slade. Um, <laughs> because, you know, you, you, yeah. because you climb that ladder. You have to climb the ladder. There is nothing below you but water. And if you fell, and it has happened many times, you'll die. You'll get sucked under that enormous ship, or you'll be crushed between the two vessels. Um, unfortunately, it's happened many times and Eric actually had two accidents he broke his back and he shattered his heel in two separate accidents so he's lucky he's alive the uh, the book is called Into the Raging Sea. It's written by our guest Rachel Slade. It is getting five star reviews across the board. It's number one in many categories. Uh, it's just a big hit, and it's it's such a new story. It feels like news, uh, ex- except for the fact that it's um, it's four hundred pages or so. I'm just trying to think. Uh, Three hundred seventy seven. It's. I mean, you have done such an amazing job. I love the idea that you took each person and gave a story were you at the meeting in february of 2016 up in jacksonville oh sure i went to to the um national transportation safety board our heroes by the way and the u.s coast guard held joint hearings and three of them and each ran two weeks so it's six full weeks of hearings and i did attend some of the hearings in jacksonville so i was in the room I was with the family members. I, you know, listened to the witnesses. I knew the people running the investigation. It was intense, as you can imagine. Wow. wow. And it, it, it must have been extremely emotional for the people that were transcribing the data, the recordings. Absolutely. But, you know, the most moving part was the family members because their whole agenda was making sure that in all of this, their loved ones and the mariners who are currently at sea weren't lost in all of this. You know, that do, people remembered who they were. Do we end up, I don't, I hope I don't spoil the book, so don't answer it if it will, but I mean, do we, <laughs> do we end up having empathy for, for Captain Davidson or do we end up the way the news portrayed him as, uh, as just a careless captain? Yeah, so it's easy to dismiss Davidson, and it's easy to say that. And again, that's that's the risk that you run when you do short form, right? When you when you have to quickly summarize something, yeah, it, it changes the story. Davidson was a very complicated figure, and I and hope that story. I drew him. Yeah, I hope I drew him with with compassion. Did you speak to his wife? No, she's, uh, Davidson was sued by several family members for wrongful death. How, oh, oh, I see. And, and does she have to carry that weight? She has to carry that weight? I can't imagine what it's like to be Teresa Davidson. No, no, no. I don't mean as far as emotionally, but I mean, is she responsible for whatever money is determined to be owed? So the family's all settled with the shipping company, Tote. Shipping company was only liable for the... Um, the value of the ship. So total, Tote was only responsible for $25 million, which was dispersed among the 33 families. Hmm. How many... This is a separate lawsuit, sorry. I got you. How, how many flags can a ship fly under? Oh, I think only one. Oh, okay. So, so then- this was an... Yeah, so this was an American ship. It's a Jones Act ship. I know last year after Hurricane Maria, the Jones Act was in in the news a lot because Puerto Rico can only serve from the U.S. ports by Jones Act ships, which means they have to be American-owned, American-built, and crewed by predominantly American workers. Um, What we didn't do... Is the thing we didn't do, and I thought we didn't need to do it, is because I thought everybody knew this story. 
but can you uh, maybe do what we should have done in the beginning and just kind of remind us what happened? Uh, it was October 2015, I think. Yeah, right? happy, happy to do that. Um, so Tote Maritime is a shipping company. It's actually based in, in Jacksonville and, um, and the West Coast. They had a twice daily shipping, oh, sorry, twice weekly shipping run to Puerto Rico. This was one of their, one of two ships that they had that did that run. Um, the ship was carrying 33 mariners, $25 million worth of goods. She sailed for some reason straight into a category three hurricane off the Bahamas and went down in 15,000 feet of water. And again, the, the big news here, I mean, that's the big news. It was the deadliest maritime disaster in more than 35 years mm -hmm. for American maritime. But I mean, the big news is really that we got that black box. It took a lot of work. It took $3 million to recover that black wow. box. Wow, wow. Yeah, but it's the longest black box recording in history, 26 wow. hours. Wow. Uh, why did they have to lobby Congress to retrieve the black box? Why couldn't they do it on their own? Well, it costs a lot of money, $3 million, and the National Transportation Safety Board has a budget. It wasn't that they really had to lobby so much as just go to Congress and request more money. And there were a lot of advocates, um, including, I believe, Marco Rubio. So, um, you know, the Congress was very supportive of the investigation. Congress wanted to know what happened to the ship. It's a, it's a tragic story. It's a heartbreaking story, but it's a very American story, and they wanted to solve the mystery as much as anybody else. Uh, just as a side note, the hurricane was Hurricane Joaquin, right? Correct. Hurricane Joaquin, which very few people know about. It caused um, catastrophic flooding in South Carolina, but other than that, it was a pretty compact storm. It stayed where it was which was right there off the Bahamas for several days and then went back out into the Atlantic. So we didn't hear about it because it didn't really touch the U.S. US soil Did, other than South Carolina. This question is probably impossible to answer, but do we know why he, I mean, other than trying to save his job and all that, why didn't he take a different route or, or put it off a day? Because that hurricane moved through the area in one day, if I remember right. Yeah, so that hurricane actually picked up really fast. It started as a tropical form, storm and then just accelerated beyond anybody's expectations. So the predictions, the forecasts coming out of the National Hurricane Center were, were flawed. I mean, they did their best, they used their models, but they didn't get it right. So he, Captain Davidson, was basing his route on... Oh inaccurate information oh my god and he also had conflicting information he had two different weather service forecasts aboard the bridge and he favored one which was actually based on the national hurricane center's forecast but was further out of date so he didn't understand that that second one was a just a delayed recap of the more current information that was at his fingertips and he preferred that second forecast so he, he, as the uh, captain and the main guy, weren't there any other uh, people that were involved in a, a small circle that would be asked to give their opinion? So, Robin, mm -hmm. on the ship, the captain is God. This is a quasi-military organization. You respect your commanding officer. You can't remember mutiny was punishable by death up until the late 19th century. Um, insubordination is extremely serious. So here, you know, on land, doing our office jobs or whatever job you have, if somebody asks you to do something you don't disagree with, you can grumble, you can walk off, you can do whatever you want. On a ship, you execute orders. And these officers discussed among themselves what was going on. They tried to convince the captain several times that he maybe consider other options, but ultimately they were doing their jobs. They were professional and they followed his orders. And we know that because of the, the black box recordings? That's exactly right. And without that black box, we never would have oh understood this. I, I, I have so many questions about that, but we do have a phone call. Are you okay with taking phone calls, first of all? Sure, absolutely. Okay, let me go to the phone. Thank you for calling in for waiting. You're on the air with Rachel Slade. Uh, good, good morning. Good morning. Yes, this, uh, in many ways, uh, is a later, uh, a later parallel to the uh, third fleet encounter with the typhoon uh, when they were on their way to support the landing on Luzon in 1944. 
only, only it was a very large typhoon, and the uh, uh, typhoon tracking was in its infancy, and uh, they kept turning the fleet this way and that way, and they kept running into the storm. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, a, a, a tragedy. Uh, have a good day, all. Thank you. So does wow, that thank you for that. I love the World War II naval um, uh, history buffs because that's not something I'm a little weak on that, um, but I love hearing these stories because, yeah, there are so many parallels. You yeah. can find examples all over history. Yeah, my uh, stepdad was part of the Merchant Marine in World War II. God bless him. And, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but although the U.S. US Merchant Marine is not an armed forces, they are constricted to carry troops and material during war. And the U.S. Merchant Marine lost more people than any of the armed forces during World War II. Gosh. The, the one thing I think that is interesting, and it's sort of like any, any story like the Titanic, where you know the ending, it's kind of weird that you read the book even though you know the ending. And, and it's, it just holds you the whole way through. It's, it's everything in between that we don't know, right? That's why this is uh, getting such great reviews. Uh, let me see if I can squeeze in another phone call before we run out of time. Good morning. Thank you for calling. You're on the air with Rachel Slade. Well, uh, good morning. I am, uh, was in the uh, Navy, and I was always on either ships or boats for my entire earlier life. And uh, it is true what you said, that the captain is God, and uh, he makes the ultimate decisions. My uncle, who was in the uh, Merchant Marine uh, during World War II, and uh, up until uh, he passed away, uh, he had his captain's papers, but he'd rather be uh, first mate on the ship. In other words, second in command. Oh, he didn't want to be God. And, <laughs> and no. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the point is, the uh, matter is usually uh, you have what they call the sailor's Bible. It's Bowditch at that time. And uh, if you follow that, it's a good guide to staying out of trouble. In other words, if a hurricane is heading north, the east side of the hurricane is the worst side you want to be on, whereas the west side is a little better if you have to go through a hurricane. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff like that that you have to take into consideration, even ocean depth. If it's a shallow ocean, you're going to, the, the waves and everything are going to be a lot worse than uh, in, the, in the much deeper part. But anyway, the, the, uh, I'm not trying to explain away or, or say or belittle the captain's judgment, but uh, with today's technology, uh, I'm used to using the stars, sextant, and uh, other regular old uh old tiny navigation equipment and uh, you can't go wrong by looking at a barometer hmm. in, in general 80 percent of the time a barometer just whether it's rising or falling or going up and then suddenly dropping uh, any quick movement of that barometer you know you're in for a bad uh, yeah storm. thank you thank you for well, you, know, you, you raise a really good point i mean the we rely so much on technology these days and it gives us a certain false sense of complacency, right? We're trusting yeah, technology, yeah. and I think this story is also about that. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And I think what's, what's going to happen, and probably is already happening, those who are reading the books who happen to have the same background as the callers we just had, they're probably at their VA halls or whatever talking about it. I can imagine that this book is going to have a life of its own. Well, oh, thank you. It's very thorough, too. I mean, it answers all the questions, in uh, my opinion. Let me tell you something. Rachel was kind enough to send us a copy of the book, and I would love to give it away. I only have one, so if you call right now, I'll, I'll grab a call at random, and you can have the book. Everybody else, go buy it. It's on Amazon. Rachel, do you have a website? Yeah, go to my website. It's rachelslade.net. There's a lot of information there about the accident and more information about the book. My gosh, look at how many calls we're getting, Robin. All right, let me grab yeah, one. Yeah, it's huge. I don't even uh, let's see. I'll pick this one. You got the book. Who's this? Uh, this is Jim Pana. Jim, you got it. It'll, it'll be waiting for you here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rachel, congratulations. You have done an outstanding job. Thank you for taking time to talk to us about the book. 
Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. That was awesome. All right. We will be right back. Started in 1975, it's Yendel's Building Materials. Whether you're making repairs, adding a room, or building a house, Yendel's constantly delivers excellent service and top quality materials and many of the tools and hardware you need to get the job done. At Yendel's, they take pride in supplying their customers with new and innovative products. Yendel's experience in trust design, manufacturing, and component materials is second to none. 834 North Magnolia Avenue in Ocala, 732-3000. Stop by to experience the difference. With a graduate degree in management and leadership from Webster University, there'll never be a better time for you to explore what's next in your career. Classes are scheduled so you can continue your normal workday routine, and the accelerated program means a new term starts about every 10 weeks. If you're looking to gain a broad general management and leadership perspective, then Webster University's management and leadership degree program is the right one for you. It's all a part of what's next at Webster University. Go to webster.edu slash manage. Accredited by ACBSP. Here is your one-minute news brief from the source WOCA. Florida Governor Rick Scott said yesterday that the state would hire special election security consultants in advance of this year's critical elections. A 26-year-old bicyclist in the bicycle lane was killed after being struck by a pickup truck and then run over by a second vehicle early yesterday morning in Lake County.